Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Metrum Institute uh, 210, Essentials of Population PKPD Modeling and Simulation. We're in our second lab session this week, and uh, we're going to follow up on two of the problems that we introduced in Chapter 1. The first of which is an exposure response analysis for our Phase 1 uh, QTC monitoring, uh, where we have uh, data from a, from a small Phase 1 study pooled together across individuals. You have repeated measures within subject, uh, but we're pooling these as if they all um, have arisen from a single subject and looking at this population relationship. And you see that this relationship here appears to be some somewhat linear um, with uh, an increasing uh, QTC change from baseline as a function of plasma concentration of our hypothetical drug MI2005A. The next problem is, is a very similar one where we're looking at uh, data from another endpoint collected in our phase one study. And this is uh, elevations of uh, liver enzymes. Here we're using uh, the uh, AST transferase enzyme uh, as a marker. Um, and we see that uh, it appears in the population again to, to uh, follow some sort of a relationship with concentration here, uh, although uh, a lot of variability involved. So for both of these, our task is to develop a model, estimate parameters, and in this case we're estimating typical parameters for the population mean, um, we're not uh, going to bother with a, with a mixed effects model at this point. Um, and to explore the impact of different uh, weighting schemes, different assumptions about the variability in the data. Okay. The, um, before we move ahead to that, I want to take a minute to explore the... Uh, extended least squares, nonlinear regression, uh, objective function, one more time. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, our recording of the last lab session was cut short by about 10 minutes. Um, we've since fixed that problem, but, um, but I'm going to take a couple of minutes now just to review this before we move ahead to, uh, to the uh, practice problems. If you recall, in our example, when we were illustrating these different objective functions, we had some observed data here, concentration time data. Uh, and we also had um, plotted those data on the right-hand panel here, where you see the model prediction and the purple line and the data points are the blue diamonds. That model prediction is an IV bolus model specified here in the prediction equation, which is just uh, dose divided by uh, volume times an expo exponentiated uh, negative uh, clearance divided by volume times time. And that prediction changes for each time point uh, as a function of time and as a function of these parameters here, these estimated parameters for volume and clearance. In addition, the noise itself, the, the variability is modeled as a parameter in this analysis. And that's this parameter here, sigma squared, the residual variance. That enters into our objective function here, which is equal to the observed minus the predicted squared divided by E7, which is the variance, plus the log of the variance. When we define the variance here, we're, we're simply stating that it's equal to some, some random variable. And here we're taking the square root of sigma squared. Uh, times C7, which is the prediction. So what we're saying is that we're assuming that the residual variability is proportional to the predicted concentration value, a proportional variance. <clears throat> weighted residuals are calculated in the same way where, you, where they're weighted by the variance at each point, and, res, and of course the raw residuals are unweighted, and it's just the, the absolute uh, difference between observed and predicted values. All right, we're going to run this one because we ran out of time uh, in the last lab session. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you here is, is maybe a new starting point. Um, we started uh, maybe, I think, at 15 liters 
as an estimate for volume and 2.5 liters per hour. Um, so looking at the plot here, um, you see that that's, that relationship is uh, close to the observed data. It's not exactly uh, in the middle of the data there, but it's, it's a pretty good starting point. And again, this is a useful tactic when you're first starting a regression problem, especially a nonlinear regression problem uh, in a population context, is to take that initial model structure, initial estimates, and make a prediction, compare that prediction graphically with the observed data. All right, so what we need to do, is you see we're starting off with an objective function here, which is the sum across all of the individual contributions to the objective function. A total objective function of 81 points. We want to minimize that objective function by searching across this parameter space. So I'm just going to illustrate that here. Um, we're using the solver tool, which is our iterative um, search algorithm. And we're going to set the target cell G3 to a minimum by changing cells. The, the cells to be changed here are the cells that contain our model parameters. And then we're also going to have constraints here so that all of these parameters are positive. So say greater than or equal to some very small value. Okay, and then those are basically the, the, uh, the constraints of our estimation problem. We've got an objective function defined, we have parameters, we have constraints on those parameters, and now what we need to do is search that parameter space for the uh, optimal estimates of these parameters. So we're using a tool here called the solver. Uh, I'm actually running it in OpenOffice. This is the open source uh, Office suite. Uh, and there's a, a slightly different algorithm for the solver here. But if you use Excel, there's also a solver add-in uh, on, on the Windows side that will do nonlinear estimation. Um, we're going to double check the solver here. We're going to use this um, SCO evolutionary algorithm. And I'm going to change the stagnation tolerance. This is a um, this is a measure of uh, how consistent the parameters need to be before minimization is reached. So I'm going to say we need to be significant in into the third. We need to be stagnant into the third um, decimal point, which, by the way, is the um, default setting for non-mem as well. Most uh, nonlinear regression search algorithms uh, do um, set their criteria for minimization of the search based on stability of the parameter estimates up to some certain precision. Okay, so we've got everything set up to go here. Now we're going to solve, and we're going to observe the uh, change in, in the prediction model now as um, iterations proceed. And you see pretty quickly here, it, it seems to be honing in on something that looks um, a little bit better than our initial estimate. Um, it, the process has stagnated, uh, meaning that it's, that it's minimized here. According, and we're going to keep these results and compare them. So remember, we, we, our initial guess um, was 15, I think, and 2.5. And we also had a, um, an objective function of about 80 points. Well, now we've, we've done the iterations, and we've come up with an objective function value that's lower, 63, and a, and a goodness of fit plot that looks, that looks quite good. And we can look at subsequent plots here. Um, for extended least squares, residuals versus predicted. You see the, the heteroscedastic nature of the data here with larger variability at the higher predictions. Weighted residuals versus predicted. Now it's a little more evened out. That tells us that our weighting strategy is probably pretty good or adequate for this case. Residuals versus time. Uh, as you'd expect, there's larger variability near the peak. Uh, and then weighted residuals as well versus time, a little more balanced. So it overall does, does pretty well. Um, and then this last page here just uh, compares this one simulation across methods um, and looks at the difference between linear regression, ordinary least squares, weighted least squares, and extended least squares. Uh, looking across these here, you know, this is just one iteration. If you really wanted to compare these methods, you'd do this hundreds of times. Uh, but just as a, this quick snapshot, you see that uh, overall they all did pretty well. They're quite close to the true values. Um, of 3 and, and 20 for clearance and volume. Uh, and that the percent error here was um, 
was pretty uh, pretty close uh, among these methods. The ones that perf- seem to perform the best are as actually extendedly squares uh, across both parameters. Um, Ordinarily squares, weighted least squares, similar actually weighted least squares did a little worse, and uh, and, and linear regression also. Um, so um, in this case, it's difficult to, to choose one over the other, but you would you would make the selection based on the re- diagnostic plots, and in particular the residuals versus prediction and weighted residuals versus prediction. It's clear in this model that we have a heteroscedastic variant, so you you'd, you'd want to use one of the um, objective functions that allows for uh, an increasing proportional or exponential increasing um, concentration variability uh, with, with the concentration prediction. Okay, so that's the review of, of that tool. Let's go back now to the uh, homework problems. And actually I'm just going to stay right where I am. Um, Pick the other window. Okay. So what I've got here is um, is a similar setup for the uh, QT and the AST problems. And uh, I'll post the solution after the lab. But what we have here are uh, multiple spreadsheets. First, I've done the QT exposure response using ordinary least squares and weighted least squares. And then I've done the AST problem uh, using a linear model uh, with ordinary least squares, a linear with weighted least squares, an Emacs model with ordinary least squares, and an Emacs model with weighted least squares. And we'll compare all of those. So let's go to the first one. Let's go back here. Um, Yeah, so first is, let, let's start with QT, ordinary least squares. Here I have plotted the data, um, and the blue points represent the concentration response relationship for delta QTC. Uh, the orange line here is our current model prediction. Yeah, this is actually an optimized solution here. What, what, what I wanted to do is, uh, is to start off by showing how, how we might begin with this. So you might look at the data initially and say, well, what's the intercept here? The inter- intercept's pretty close to zero. I'm going to give you some, some small positive number as an intercept. And then the slope estimate, well, you could sort of eyeball the slope, I guess. You could, you could look at how many units the rise is versus the, the run. Um, but uh, you could also just play around with this and, and plug in some different numbers. So what if we said 0.03? What happens to our slope? OK, we see that, that it. Uh, all right, at our initial estimate here, it's a little bit off. Uh, and you could even um, tweak this by just through graphics to, to, to hone in on some better initial estimates. Maybe we'll put it at 0.025. Uh, OK, Maybe, let's call that a starting point. You'll see for that model prediction, I've also plotted the residuals versus pred. And weighted residuals is the same plot here because it's uh, ordinary least squares. This is the zero reference. And you see that there's a, there's a trend towards a bias in the residuals, where the residuals are increasingly negative as the prediction increases. So there's, there's some bias in our initial estimates, but it's not that far off. The concentration effect data are plotted here in the first two columns. Uh, we have concentration and, and delta QTC. These are taken from the data set that I supplied as the homework problem. We have a prediction model that's equal to a linear model. We have an intercept plus a slope times concentration. Okay. The objective function is simply an ordinary least squares objective function. We have the observed minus the predicted B6 minus C6 squared for each individual. We sum that up over here to get the total objective function, which is the sum of all of these data points. Then the residual is just the observed minus the predicted, and the weighted residual is the same. So weighted residual is not relevant in a uh, ordinary least squares problem. Okay, so it, we're at the point now where I think uh, we have enough st- structure that we could try to estimate this. So we're going to again use the solver tool. I'm going to set G2 to a minimum by changing the values of our parameters, which are these parameters here, B3 and C3. 
the intercept and slope. Uh, in this case, we don't need to provide constraints because it's quite possible since this is a delta QTC that there might be a small negative offset on the intercept. And really, you know, we don't have to assume that the slope is, is positive. Uh, it could be that there's that there's negative slope here, but it looks from the graphics looks pre pretty clear that it's positive. Just for illustration purposes, I'm not going to uh, set any constraints on this particular uh, parameter. Uh, options, uh, I'm going to use the, the other algorithm. Oops. No, oh, sorry about that. The software crashed on me. Let me go back and open it again. Well, while this is running here, what, what we're going to do is we're going to run each of these um, re regression problems under the different conditions. Here we go. Let me try that one more time. We'll set the objective function to a minimum value by changing our parameter estimates. We're going to use this uh, evolutionary algorithm. I'm going to change the tolerance to three significant digits again. OK. And we'll try to solve this one here. So, so take note of the objective function, which started out at 4,686. Um, it's changing, and you, you can see the value of the objective function here at, at each iteration um, in the solver window. What happens in these iterative search techniques is that um, so sometimes they make multiple evaluations in different directions before taking a, uh, an iteration step. That can take a little bit of time if the... If the um, if the algorithm can't find the uh, the steepest descent or or, or the uh, the next logical step in in in, in an efficient way, um, this one here we're actually fitting a, a linear model with a nonlinear tool, so it's probably not the best match of solver. But I uh, just wanted to illustrate um, what this what this would look like. And it's still searching now. You see the objective function has dropped significantly, about uh, oh, about 800 points, and um, it's continuing to, to decline. All that's happening now is that the parameters aren't changing very much. Um, and uh, we're, we're very close to a minimum value uh, with respect to the, the parameter space. Um, but it's just taking a, a while for those parameters to stabilize. Okay, we're there. Let's keep those results. And so your objective function dropped down to 3,842. Uh, we have a small negative intercept here, essentially zero. And we've got a slope estimate of 0 0.017. Let's take a look at the diagnostic plots. And this is ordinary least squares, but you see here the pattern between residuals and prediction. Here's the zero line right through the middle of the data, that's, that indicates a good fit as well. And the scatter around the data, there's maybe a bit more variability up here, but it, it seems quite, uh, quite con constant across the range. So um, in this case, the model seems to have done quite well. Let's see what would happen if we ran a weighted least squares regression with the same data set. We're talking about the same setup here. I'll try to use the same initial estimates. And now we have three plots. We have the uh, observed relationship with the prediction on top of it. Residuals versus prediction and weighted residuals versus prediction. We're going to minimize 
this objective function again same setup with the same parameters to be iterated upon okay we're all set to go let's try this one out now you see some uh, a little less stable behavior here in the search where some some odd slopes were were explored uh, in, in some of those initial steps. We should compare that to to the process that we saw under the ordinary least squares. And um, we'll let this run a little bit, but one thing you can observe by looking at the residuals plots it's going to tell us, uh, give us some insight as to why this model is having a little more difficulty. And that is the pattern in the variability. So if we look at the residuals versus prediction, it's approximately an equal band across the range of what I might call a homoscedastic relationship, maybe slightly increased variability at the high end, uh, but uh, that might be just due to bias here in the current prediction. Um, relatively constant variance. But look at what happens when we go to the weighted residual. The weighted residual for this particular example um, has some very large values at the low concentrations here, almost an overinflated uh, weighted residual. When you go from negative 80 up to positive 80, that's 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 a huge weighted residual. After that, you know, it's pretty well centered. But this is indicating that the, the variance associated with these time points is probably too small or, or it, 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 it's, uh, it's adjusting such a way that all data points are not being treated equally. Uh, these points at the low prediction are having way too much influence relative to the rest. Okay, so we'll keep the result. You'll see goodness of fit wise, you know, residuals looks okay. The, um, the concentration response slope looks okay. Let's compare the parameter estimates. We've got 0.04 at the intercept and 0.014 uh, versus our ordinary least squares answer, which was a negative intercept, slightly small negative, and 0.017. Uh, so we've got, we're getting some slightly different answers in that third uh, decimal place. Uh, we see a difference in the residuals pattern. And overall, my decision here would be that, uh, that the linear regression with the ordinary least squares is the preferred fit. Uh, just because of the diagnostics here, when we look at weighted residuals versus pred, we shouldn't see this, this heteroscedastic nature. It should be constant throughout. Notice the objective function is lower now, 165 for the weighted least squares versus 3,842. 3, um, we can't compare those because they're not the same estimation method, and so it's not fair to make the model comparisons that way. What we need to do is compare the diagnostic plots. So for, the, for this particular problem, uh, we would select a linear model with ordinary least squares regression. Let's move on to the AST data then. For the AST model, we have a similar setup. And first, we're going to try to, to fit this concentration response data with a simple linear regression. So we've got the concentration and response data in the first two columns. We have a model prediction, which is just a linear model based on an intercept and slope. The objective function is an ordinary least squares objective function, um, which is summed up here across all data points. Uh, the residuals and weighted residuals are the same here because there's no weighting involved. And we're going to try the search. This is an optimized value. Let's just use our, our graphics here to say, well, where's the intercept? What does it look like? Uh, maybe about 20. OK. And then we look at the blue data. What does the slope look like? Well, if we looked at uh, maybe it's about 0.05. OK, so we can start there. Let's try to run this one. We'll run the solver again. So we're going to minimize cell G2 by varying, in this, in this model, it's A, A3 and B3. 
And uh, any constraints here? Yeah, we should have a constraint because this is not a change from baseline. This is actual AST. So the intercept, at least, should be positive. So we'll set a reference here so that the uh, intercept parameter, A3, is uh, greater than or equal to some very small number. OK, and we'll use the same solver, same tolerance for convergence and solve. So this linear model is trying to find the, the best fit in that in that cloud of data. And it's getting there. Actually, it looks pretty close to convergence now. Probably just need a few more iterations to uh, stabilize in the last few decimal points. OK. And keep that result. And you see that. Um, uh, the overall fit, eh, not not great, but it's it's sort of cut, caught the trend here. We have an objective function value of, of uh, 21,521. Um, residuals versus pred, you know, they do show some patterns here. You've got a, a run of positive residuals up here and then some negative residuals down here. So it's not a perfect fit. Okay, so maybe it's our weighting strategy. So if we go to the uh, the weight of these squares implementation of the same model. In the weight of these squares, we have the same setup, but the objective function now is weighted by one, one over the observation. Okay. And we'll use the same starting points 20 and uh, 0 0.05. And let's try to minimize this one. And as we're going through this, if questions arise, please feel free to type them into the question box on the GoToMeeting dialog. We'll keep the, the same constraint here, so the intercept is positive, and we'll use the same algorithm. Okay, let's solve. Again, uh, lots of variation in the search. Um, Looks like it's getting closer to a minimum now, just based on the graphics. And we've probably got a few more iterations before we've reached the minimization criteria. Okay, we're there. Let's keep the result. And we see that uh, we've got an exposure response relationship for AST versus concentration. It is monotonically increasing. Uh, but we, dil we still do have some patterns in the residuals. Uh, a tight clustering at the low end with some positive residuals and then some uh, large negative residuals. When we look at the weighted residuals versus spread, uh, since this is a weighted least squares, um, we see, you know, for most of it, a pretty well um, captured uh, variability, but uh, some, some big bias here early on. Um, and so uh, this is really a problematic diagnostic. Uh, there's something wrong. So what we've done right now is we've assumed a linear model and tried two different weighting strategies. And that didn't really cut it. We still have problems. So the next thing would be to maybe try a nonlinear model. And, and if you look at this data carefully, it, 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 it could maybe give, give rise to a nonlinear relationship. So we'll try that here with an Emax type model. Uh, now we have, in an Emacs model, we have three parameters. We have a, an intercept, an E0 parameter, and I'm going to set that at about 20. An EC50, which is the concentration that gives you half of the maximum, and just eyeballing it here, you know, if, if our maximum is somewhere up here around 80, and we're starting at 20, well, maybe, maybe something around uh, a concentration of, of, of 250. Not 205, 250. And then an Emax of effect. Well, if we start at 20 and we're going up to, let's, let's say 60 points for our Emax. Okay, and this is completely uh, an eyeball guess. And you can tell from our prediction at the initial estimates, 
it's not the perfect fit, but, um, but we'll give it a try. The objective function, again, is ordinary least squares. So we just got to observe minus predicted squared. Residuals and weighted residuals are the same. The total objective function is the sum across all those parameters. Let's minimize now. So the same target cell, we're going to change now. Uh, we have more than those two. We're, we're going to use, oops, stop. I didn't mean to just do that. <laughs> Got ahead of myself. Sorry about that. We, uh, we want to set the um, parameter values to all three here, A, B, and C in row three. And we can set all of them now with some constraints because this is, uh, these parameters all have to be positive. So let's uh, define that as well. All of these values should be greater than zero. Uh, we're going to use the same solver with the same tolerance level. That's fine. Okay, now let's give it a shot. And we see now that the relationship looks to be a bit better described by this nonlinear model than by the linear one. Not too bad. It looks like we're pretty close to a solution now. Um, this data set could probably benefit from more data at the, at the higher concentrations to help define that Emax parameter, but it's, uh, it's doing pretty well. And uh, as you know, with a nonlinear model with three parameters, it's, it's going to take a little bit longer to solve than the simple linear model, which was just two parameters. Uh, but you see here that we're approaching uh, a successful minimization. Um, as this stagnation line increases, that indicates that the parameters are becoming more and more stable until we reach the uh, criterion we set for three significant digits. Okay, we've got a solution. We'll keep the result. Here we see the, the final fit uh, of the observed data. Uh, the model prediction seems to do pretty well here for the population, right down the, right down the middle. Let's look at the, uh, this is ordinary least squares, so we look at residuals versus prediction. Weighted residuals versus prediction is the same thing here. There is no weighting. And, you know, it's pretty clear here we have that classic sort of uh, increasing variability uh, where, where data points are clustered tightly at the low end and we have the increasing variance as you increase the prediction. Now this model didn't weight according to that. Uh, the, the, this model assumed a constant variance um, or this objective function assumes a constant variance but it still did a pretty decent job at estimating the parameters. But it would lead me to think that we need to go one step further and to adjust the objective function to now account for the increasing variability, the heteroscedastic variability that's seen with, um, with this data set. So of course that's the next spreadsheet, the next tab, and we'll reset our parameters to uh, the same initial estimates we had before, 250 for the EC50, and I think we said 60 points in the Emax. Okay. Now the prediction is the same as it was before, but the objective function is different in that we are weighting the squared difference between the observed and prediction by the observed values. So a weighting factor is one over observation. The residuals are simply the observed minus the predicted, but the weighted residual here is the residual divided by the observed value. All right, let's see if, if weighting this in a heteroscedastic manner improves the fit. Run the solver. We're going to again minimize cell G2 to a value, a minimum value as small as we can get it. Um, iterating on the parameters A through C3. And uh, we'll solve.
So this is uh, seems to be doing pretty well here. Exploring the space, but uh, all of these candidate parameter sets are uh, are within the the data range. And now that we've weighted the higher observations, uh, that means that this curve is going to be driven more by the concentrations at the low end, right? Because those at the high end are seen to have higher variability. Uh, they're, they're going to um, have less of an impact on the overall objective function calculation. And so the fit is driven by some of the lower concentrations here. Okay, we reached a solution here. We'll keep that result. Now let's take a look at the resulting plots. The observed, minus, the, um, observed and uh, predicted overlay looks, looks decent. There's still a lot of variability in this relationship. Uh, we ended up with a lower objective function now, um, but we, we can't compare this to the ordinary least squares. The residuals versus prediction, again, we see the cone-shaped sort of pattern of the heteroscedastic variability. So that's... Um, that's something that we dealt with here by, by weighting proportional to the prediction. And we have um, the um, weighted residuals versus prediction now, for the most part, are all within this plus or minus one weighted residual unit. Now you got a few points out here that, that extend down to nine, minus three in the weighted residuals. And um, that probably indicates a little bit of bias. Uh, you know, it, it's also potentially because we're just sim simply fitting a, a naive pooled approach here to, to data that more variable. But overall, you see that um, most of the points do line up in this, in this well, uh, constant scattered region around the zero line. So overall, pretty good fit. And I would say, uh, looking at these diagnostics, that the uh, Emax model with weighted least squares uh, is better than the Emax model with ordinary least squares. Uh, just because of the residuals pattern. But then let's compare it back to the linear model. So the Emax model with weighted least squares, we have an, ob an objective function of 760. We compare that to the linear model with the weighted least squares. Well, that has an objective function of 932. We can compare those because the objective function is, is being calculated under the same method, weighted least squares. They're just different model structures. So based on an AIC type calculation, uh, we have one more parameter in the other model. So, so the AIC would be 2 plus the objective function, but still 2 plus 760 is still far below uh, 930. So based on an AIC calculation, um, we have an improved fit here with the Emax model. Uh, but if we look at the other diagnostics, uh, it's clear that from the diagnostic plots, we have an improved goodness of fit with the Emax model as well. Okay, I'm going to answer a couple of questions now uh, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll come back and revisit this. So uh, somebody's asking if the presentation, if this uh, spreadsheet that we're presenting right now is on the website, as I indicated before, this is the solution to your homework problem. I will post it at the end of, at the end of class. Um, if you were going to do the hands-on work, uh, I was expecting that you would have done something like this. Okay, the other question, uh, why don't we run extended least squares for today's example? In which situation should we use extended least squares? Well, we, we could have run extended least squares. Um, and in fact, I just chose these two uh, because of the simpler of the two. Uh, but certainly extended least squares could be used in any case whether you have a constant variance or a heteroscedastic variance. You would just have to, to supply that relationship of the variance model, uh, whether it's a constant variance model or a proportional variance model or an exponential variance model, whatever you uh, assume the relationship might be, uh, and, and that becomes part of the modeling process. And if anybody wants to try that uh, and has questions, I'd be glad to, to review that. In fact, you know, we have a little bit of time. Maybe we could uh, map one of these over to, um, to extended least squares. And copy this. No, that's not what I want to do. I 
I can at least get you started with this. I'll make a copy at the end. And we'll change the name to ELS. Okay, so to, to, to do an, an extended least squares regression, we need, we're going to need another column here. Uh, insert column. And we're going to need another parameter too. We're going to need uh, sigma squared. Sigma squared now, uh, we'll throw in some, some estimate. And our objective function is going to be different as well, right? It's going to be uh, the observed minus predicted squared divided by the variance. Now here the variance is actually going to be equal to this cell over here, which is empty. Let's define that now. The variance is going to be equal to sigma squared, whoops, the square root of sigma squared, so sigma squared to the 0 0.5 times the model prediction. Okay, so the objective function is the observed minus the predicted squared divided by the variance. Okay, plus the log of the variance. Okay, let's fill that in. I've got to propagate the variance too. Oh, I made a mistake here. I need to uh, anchor the variance term. The dollar sign anchors it to a, a specific cell. And same thing here. Okay, good. All right, so now we're going to run extended least squares. Let me review what I did there. I added an additional parameter, which is the residual variance. I specified an objective function that was equal to the observed minus the predicted square divided by the variance plus the log of the variance. We described the variance at each time point as the square root of the of the variance. Actually, this, this variance uh, is, is, is proportional um, standard deviation. And uh, we're taking the square root of sigma squared times the model prediction. Okay, so we're assuming a proportional relationship again. Let's set these back to the values that we used initially. 20, 250, um, and then we've got uh, an Emacs of about 60. Okay, and we're just guessing what sigma squared is. Um, unfortunately, these plots are not going to uh, transfer over, so I'm just going to delete these. I can create a new one. Uh, yeah, we have time here. I'll create a new one right now. So what we want to do is to plot all of these. And we're going to um, choose a scatter plot. I'm sure that some of you out there are probably quite proficient with Excel or spreadsheets. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we use this as a, as a formal analysis tool for, for real um, uh, research, but uh, for illustration purposes, it's not bad. So we'll just use this one for now. Uh, and let's minimize the objective function now, tools solver. We want to minimize that by now we have four parameters to estimate. And we want the um, all of those parameters to be constrained to be positive. Okay. And let's try to solve this one. Oh, well, of course, it's going to minimize here because I've set the wrong cell. Uh, let's 
uh, restore previous. It's not cell G2, it's actually H2. I had moved it over. Okay, let's try again now. Now, this is going to take longer now because we've added an additional parameter. Uh, it's extended least squares and it's a variance parameter. Variance parameters are often uh, difficult to estimate uh, relative to fixed effects parameters. And we can see the search moving through. And we're getting close. So you can see that uh, extended least squares uh, you know, appears to give a similar performance. Uh, we'll, we'll finish the diagnostic plots, but it seems to be similar performance to the uh, weighted least squares objective function when we write out the extended least squares as a proportional model. So if you had a choice and you could use any method you'd like, you probably would want to stick with extended least squares or maximum likelihood because it gives you the flexibility to estimate the, the weighting factor as well as how that weighting enters into the model, whether it's linear or proportional or additive or proportional. So that one looks pretty good, actually. Let's uh, make a plot of the, uh, here, we'll, we'll make a plot of the residuals. I've got both of them here actually. We'll copy that, paste it, and we'll separate them out. Data. So we'll take the, the um, weighted residuals off of this one, and we'll take the residuals off of this one. Okay. So what do we see? Pretty much the same picture we saw with weighted least squares. You see that proportional behavior of the residuals versus pred. We see a, a nicely uh, consistent value of weighted residuals except for these few uh, points here. Um, and so the estimation method doesn't seem to resolve that. Um, it could be that we need to consider this data set a little more carefully uh, than just uh, the simple assumption that it's a naive pool. Um, but if, you, if you're if you stuck using a, a, a naive pool type estimation method, these are the kinds of steps that you would use to compare. Now we can't compare the objective function of the extended least squares uh, against the others because it's a different objective function. Uh, the only ones we can compare here are within method like the Emax weighted least squares versus the, the um, linear weighted least squares or the uh, Emax ordinary least squares versus the um, linear ordinary least squares. In both cases, the Emax model outperforms the linear. So that's, uh, that's how you would do this. Um, are there any additional questions on, on this particular ex assignment? or maybe even some of the material we've covered in the first chapter. Okay, I'm going to save this document. Uh, I've actually conducted this in open office. Uh, it should translate to um, Excel. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to do that as well. Uh, if you'd like to um, implement this yourself. You could you can download OpenOffice. It's a free uh, software, uh, or you can use Excel with the Solver utility. The only reason I'm using OpenOffice is because uh, on the Macintosh, uh, the Excel version does not include a nonlinear solver. Okay. 
Any additional questions? Looks pretty quiet, so I guess we'll um, we'll wrap up for today. Oh, one more quick one more question. Are we going to review the study guide questions on page seventy-five? Uh, we can take a couple minutes and do that. Sure. What I'd like you to do is is to you know attempt them yourselves, and and if and if we don't have a chance to to cover them, um, that you could. Uh, you could go ahead and, and, and try your best to answer those and let me know if you have questions through the um, course chat. Let's, let's go through a few of these. Okay, which diagnostic is most important about, most informative about the pattern of residual variability? Remember, the pattern of variability in the data is the residuals versus PRED. Contrast that to which one is most informative about the performance of the modeling strategy with respect to the residual error variance. That's the weighted residuals versus spread. The weighted residuals includes uh, whatever strategy we've used to weight the data, and the residuals does not. Strategies to avoid or detect local minima. We've been through this, and we've even seen it here. Um, the best is to try the same regression problem from different initial estimates and uh, the, do that multiple times. Uh, you should have some consistency around a lower objective function if you're concerned about uh, multiple values of the objective function. Diagnostic plots are also useful and potentially uh, moving to a different uh, iterative search technique. Uh, distribution assumptions with maximum likelihood. The distribution assumptions, of course, it's based on normal theory. Remember, um, we said the maximum likelihood objective function for continuous endpoints assumes that we have normally distributed residual error. When we, when we extended that to the population case, we also made a parametric distribution about the inter-individual random effects where we assume that those are also normally distributed. Can we apply maximum likelihood to continuous data that are non-normally distributed? Yes, um, it's not the data distribution that matters, it's the distribution of the error. So as long as we have a model that describes uh, the central tendency across that potentially skewed distribution, it's, what left over, it's what's left over that really matters. And so as long as the residual error and, and the inter-individual error that are left over are normally distributed, then we can apply the maximum likelihood theory for, um, for continuous measures. What are some of the key assumptions that made in the first order approximation? The first order approximation is, is one of the first population methods ever developed. It makes the simple assumptions that all eta's are equal to zero uh, and that that uh, nonlinear model is, is expanded using a first order Taylor series approximation of, of the true model. It assumes that epsilon is zero as well and it also assumes that the uh, Approximation error is zero, but that's the big that's the big difference with the FO method. So, with FO, you're only getting estimates of population level, fixed effects parameters, plus the variance of the interindividual random effects and the variance of the residual random effects. A to epsilon interaction, we talked about that on Tuesday. Uh, that's uh, the in interaction between individual predictions and uh, residual error that comes into play when you're dealing with a non-constant uh, residual variance model in a population context uh, because uh, the eta epsilon interaction allows for the individual prediction to be part of that weighting component uh, of, the, of the objective function. And then last uh, sort of a tricky question, if eta bar is not significantly different from zero, does that indicate the underlying um, assumptions have been met. Well, not completely, right, because the eta bar really only tells us about the central tendency of the individual random effects. It doesn't tell us whether or not that distribution is normal. It really just indicates if the distribution was centered at zero. Um, so it doesn't completely uh, uh, validate our assumption. So give these questions some thought. Uh, if you don't understand the, the responses that I've just uh, laid out for you today, send me a note. Uh, we can discuss this at the next lab session, um, or we can discuss it via the online uh, discussion boards. 
If there are other questions in the, in the first chapter's material, uh, please also do post those uh, so that we can uh, address those. And, and maybe if you have a question, that means that uh, somebody else might, might not have understood that section as well either. Okay, no additional questions on the, uh, on the uh, control panel here, so I think we're going to wrap this up for today. Thank you very much for your attention, and we will begin again on Tuesday next week with a new topic. Uh, we'll start getting into to the population uh, models in, in a more hands-on uh, practical uh, basis. Thank you all very much, and have a nice weekend.